There are so many people who have been a part of my expat network that I often forget how we met. But occasionally, I do remember. And that's the case with Dr. Tiffany Smith. A few years ago, Tiffany reached out with an invitation to appear on her podcast, Abroad in Education. If you haven't listened to it, she created the podcast with the mission to discover roots through conscious conversations about EDPATs. If you don't know, EDPAT is the term she uses to describe expats working in education outside of their home countries. Much of her work has been influenced by her decade of domestic and international teaching experiences, which include the U.S., Morocco, and the UAE. So no surprise here, I thought Tiffany would make a great guest. At the time of this recording, Tiffany was about to embark on a new journey abroad with a return to the United Arab Emirates. She had literally just completed her PhD in organizational leadership, policy, and development at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And her dissertation study focused on the transnational migration of Black American teachers in the UAE and understanding more fully their decisions to leave PK-12 schools in the U.S. Overall, much of Tiffany's work focuses on identifying, addressing, and providing solutions for teacher retention and restoration. And it is that context that was the backdrop of our conversation. Tiffany shares candidly about being raised in a working class family and the seemingly unlikely path that led her to an international career. She gets real about what happens when the honeymoon period wears off and what she decided to do next. She also unpacks why frustration led to the creation of her podcast and the doors it has opened to help understand Black educator experiences abroad. Tiffany is usually on the other side of the interviewing table, but in this episode, you'll hear why you need to pass her the mic every now and then. Welcome to the Global Chatter. We going in. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem when I have people on the show, if y'all are listening, that I know. It never it never starts off serious. Every single person that I've had that I've known for a while, it yeah. <laughs> we just raggedy on <laughs> we raggedy Whoa. on air. We're we're setting the tone. We are setting the I'm, tone. Right. And you know exactly what to get. And so uh, welcome back to the to the global chatter. Y'all have already heard the intro, so you know that my good friend Tiffany Lachelle Smith, and I'm going to say the Dr. Tiffany Lachelle Smith, who Amen. In case you may not know, just recently at the time of this recording, got her PhD. Woo! Amen. <laughs> Look at God. Won't he do it? <laughs> Won't he? I'm about to I need to get the air horns and be like, you know, they're like, burr, burr, burr. Oh, like yeah, right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They have the sound effects, right? That's that's like right. my little geeky self. Like, yeah, find one. <laughs> yeah, I need to get to the air horns because you know, I, we we can't take things for granted. And we're gonna talk about your story, but we can't take things for granted because anyone who's completed any sort of education, right? Whether you get through your high school diploma, your college degree, or your associates, right, a grad school degree or a doctorate of some sort, it takes a lot of work. So, you know, we got to celebrate these things. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. I know you got to get used to people calling you Dr. Smith, though. That's probably I, you the- know, I do. <laughs> you know, I do. And the and I'll say the interesting thing is, um, so the a couple of days after I came home from graduation, uh, I ended up going into a bar here in Alton. And I know we'll talk a little bit about where I'm from and stuff. But I'm really connecting um, a young woman who I grew up with. Uh, she was sitting in the bar in her cap and gown <laughs> by herself. Oh. And I was like, sis, I don't like you. because <laughs> I don't like this. I'm sorry. I don't like this because it really connects to, you know, and she had just graduated with her associates. So exactly yeah. what you're saying, it doesn't matter what you graduated with. You made a goal and you accomplished it. And I hate the fact that you are here by yourself. Like you should have, and these are for first-gen student like me, first-gen college yeah. student. 
you should have a whole group of family, friends celebrating you, you know, and it's still on my heart. I don't like it. I mean, sometimes if you put it on Twitter, s- strangers will celebrate you. I've seen it on social media where folks are like, look, I don't even know you, but I'm proud of you. And that, Amen. that and sometimes people can see can see the outward appearance of a goal completed and still celebrate. And so hopefully Shaylee's has got a little bit of that. But, oh, you, know, you know, I gave her flowers. I gave her flowers like, while she could <laughs> smell it. The words, sis, you are amazing. Right. <laughs> So, I mean, you've already alluded to this, uh, but for the people who don't know, I always like to do a geography check. Where in the world are you currently sitting? Which is a real question. Because um, <laughs> I never so... really know every time you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. we can go that route. And when I tell you where I am, I know I'm going to have to explain it. So I am actually at Home Home, born and raised, Alton, Illinois. A-L-T-O-N, Illinois. Um, Alton is located geographically across the bridge from St. Louis, Missouri, Mm -hmm. and we're, we're still Illinois though. So we're five hours South of Chicago and, um, the metropolitan of the big city. Mm -hmm. So of course I have to be mindful because I've shared this in other places, but there's three facts about Alton that will help you remember where I am. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, I'm a go quick though for this one, (laughs) one tallest man in the world. Robert Wadlow, eight foot, 11 inches, born in 1918. His statue mm-hmm. is up the street, born and raised in Alton, Illinois. Okay. People have questions about what was happening in 1918 and if people like me were accepted or not, no, but he is our history. <laughs> yeah. Second thing, we are known as the most haunted small town in the nation and okay. it is connected to the prisons and how the limestone um, bricks that were (laughs) torn down were used to build homes and everything. And they say that the spirits and stuff live in it. So we have the folks come in and do the energy readings and it's all the mansions and churches and everything. (laughs) So that's that. And I'm trying to decide if I'm going to go up or down for the third one, because there's two that I can choose from. We'll go up. Uh, Miles Davis was born and mm. raised, well, was born in Alton, raised in East St. Louis. So that's, that's Alton a big one, is historic. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big one. Miles Davis, the, the famous jazz musician, trump, trumpet, right? No, no, saxophone. Saxophone. I think that's what it was. Um, and it's a shame. They just gave him a statue like within the past couple of years. So I need oh, wow. to learn his story. I got his book downstairs too. <laughs> And I, you know, and I've got, I've got his albums on my phone. Yeah. That's kind of awesome. I didn't know, I didn't know he was from that part of the the country. So that's cool. So, I mean, here's a question I ask for our internationally minded folks, you know, as a kid, did you grow up traveling and that could be domestic or international? No, I did not, but travel is in my blood and I will, I guess the way that I'll explain it, because it is, it's a little tricky. My grandfather was in the Air Force. So Mm -hmm. the day after my grandmother graduated from high school, she moved to Sevilla, Spain with my grandfather, who was in the Air Force, and she birthed my dad in Sevilla, Spain. So my dad has a birth certificate for Spain, but I believe they came back when he was like four. So um, his nickname, his name is Keith, and I just found this out. His nickname is Kiko. And I was like, well, Grandpa, who even gave him the name Kiko? He said the nanny. They couldn't say Keith with the T-H, so they called him Kiko. And I was like, does he know he got a Spanish nickname? (laughs) So I think I I will say that as far as international travel, that is, it's, it's in the blood in the sense that what my grandfather started, what my grandmother started, I took to another level. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as that, no. I mean, we had our little family reunions where we would drive up to Indiana, drive up to Wisconsin, but no domestic travel. I'm, yeah, very little domestic and international travel. Oh, my goodness. I didn't, you know, and I mean, even look, even with the domestic travel, though, like I say this all the time on the show is that you know, there's so much of the U.S. to see, even if you just stay here. That's so different from the different places we live, right? That, you know, 
driving to a Wisconsin or an Indiana or a Missouri could be just as far for people driving to other countries, right? Absolutely. <laughs> right? Because these, Absolutely. these states are big. <laughs> they're they're Absolutely. big. Absolutely. And so you, okay, so you grew up in Illinois. Where did you go for undergrad for college? Northern Illinois University. Yeah. So you, you stayed in state. Did you, um, did you study abroad? I did. And, did and, really? and stu- <laughs> yeah, study abroad is what I, I give it as, you know, the emphasis of this whole like international educator identity that I have. Um, my junior year of undergrad, I studied abroad to South Africa and it flipped my entire world upside mm. down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. What, what made you choose South Africa and what, what was unique about that experience for you? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of uh, spiritual work that is in the journey, well, at least throughout the journey of how I came to where I am now. I honestly think South Africa chose me because throughout my journey, as far as uh, completing this doctoral program, I had the opportunity to unpack for my return home is what I called it. And I started writing kind of like a positionality statement, questioning myself, you know, what made you study abroad and how did you get to this, you know, international teaching and all of this stuff. But I didn't go one day I went into the study abroad office Hadn't even heard about it. None of my friends were talking about studying abroad. I still don't remember what it was that came in my mind. Like you should consider leaving the country. Went to the, to the office one day. There's one woman, one woman ran office. And I was like, you know, I'm interested in possibly going to another country. And all she asked was, what's your major? And she found a program that, you know, they could kind of embed my major into. So it wasn't even study abroad through Northern. It was through SIT, School of International Mm -hmm. Training. So Mm -hmm. those programs, it was like a collection of 12 of us from universities all over the states. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the the program was um, education as an agent for social change. And it was all about going into the schools in South Africa. It was all about like, understanding apartheid and how it's impacted the education system, who has access, who doesn't. And the whole time, Amanda, when we were there, the the civil servants were on strike. So we (laughs) didn't even get to go into the schools. We were able to go into maybe one or two rural schools, which were further outside of the cities, because they were physically removing people out of schools. Like, you do not have an option thousands of people in the street protesting. This was teachers, um, you know, different type of civil servants. And this is the, you know, stuff that that you see on TV, like chants and, and moving and dancing and never just completely flipped my world. South Africa was significant because Black is the default. So here I am, this Black student in this early childhood program at Northern Illinois, you know, maybe there's me and a mixed person in my classes. So I'm always, you know, that one Black person. And I mean, that was higher ed. And unless you were at the Center for Black Studies, that was my higher ed experience, always being that one of maybe three max Black students in one class. Then when I went to South Africa, it was like, y'all whole country Black? (laughs) Black on the billboards, Black on the money, Black on the food and hair care products, just Black everywhere. Like in America, I'm the minority here. It, I, people would come and talk to me in Zulu and I'm like, no, I'm American. Like all I have is English. (laughs) Right. But I just, I didn't know that world existed. Had no idea. Cause I like, I always like asking that question, especially, and thank you for sharing folks who grew up in the minority somewhere. And then they all of a sudden look like the (laughs) majority and Mm -hmm. how it's like a light bulb. Right. Absolutely. All all of a sudden you're like, you don't stick out because of skin color. I mean, you may stick out because of mannerisms or language, but it's not, you know, it's not because you're black because you be like, everybody's black. And many of y'all are my shade. Exactly. And and at that point, and I know you, you, you kind of referenced this already as an undergrad, you were studying early childhood education. Mm -hmm. Was that your, your pathway? So you knew pretty early on that you were going to be, a teacher. Was that, was that the goal or was it something else? 
it was something else. I, I went through my whole program, which um, at the end of the early childhood degree, the, the teacher certification is embedded in the program, which is not the same for every state. But the entire time I was in that program, Amanda, I was I was I am not going to be a teacher. Right. <laughs> like I'm in these classrooms. I connect with students, you know, students connect with me. Teach uh, many of the other cooperating the the students who were with me. Um, they would ask their cooperating teachers, you know, can you observe me and write me a letter of recommendation? I'm like, I don't even need that because I'm not going into the classroom. <laughs> like so what that's for y'all. To- so, what were you trying to do with that degree? I had a plan to go to the Peace Corps. When I graduated, I had it in my mind: I am going to the Peace Corps, study abroad. Um really did impact my life. And what it did was it planted a seed that made me interested in seeing the world. And this is 2009. So, you know, the conversations and things that we're having now about Black people abroad and, you know, these digital lifestyles and and no location specific, all this stuff was not a conversation. To the point where the most I got in higher ed was, you know how they had the, and they probably still do, the bulletin board. And you can have, you know, want to teach English in Thailand over the right. summer type thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, no, I don't. I actually want to live abroad, you know? So there were very few conversations about how to create this lifestyle abroad. Um, and the only thing I knew about was Peace Corps because um, a young woman had come from Peace Corps to recruit at our campus. Yeah. So I went to one of those informationals and the issue was didn't know how long it took to complete that application. <laughs> right. I mean, from <laughs> dental records to health records to who, how much debt do you have? Who's going to be responsible for your debt? You know, all this like craziness. To the point where I ended up getting a job before I finished the application. (laughs) So did you, did you ever finish it and submit it? Moment of silence. Um, (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Because I was going to say, don't tell me you finished it, submitted it. They took you, but you already had a job. (laughs) <laughs> no, well, well, I did get to the point where they were telling me that I was going to be placed in, um, what is it? Federation of Micronesia. Uh, yes. yeah, that's where that they were going to you- place me. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, no, but it was, it was an entire process. Like, oh, we're thinking no, about, we could put no, you here. I, I get the process. Cause I looked at the process. I'm saying they were going to put you out in Micronesia. What happened? There it is. Yeah. Micronesia. Uh, I got a job. I got a job. <laughs> so you, you weren't like, let me go out to like, let me go hang out these beaches. Real, I mean, it's not just beach work, but look I didn't you. even know where it was. <laughs> look, where I am right now, and I always forget the name. So do I even know where it is now? <laughs> no. So, and this is this is why I call it spiritual work. Like my whole journey, um, I crossed AKA. Um, my sophomore or junior year. No, it was actually my junior year because then that summer is when I studied abroad. I think that's what makes sense. Um, but anyway, my fourth grade teacher who was, you know, in my hometown, she was also an AK. So we saw each other at a regional roundup or something. And she's like, you know, Tiffany, you're getting ready to graduate. What are you doing? And I said, yeah, I'm, I submitted my application to the Peace Corps. I'm waiting to hear back from them. She like... <laughs> Girl, you better get your resume to me before I get home. Email it to me. And I'm like, okay, you know. <laughs> and and to this day, she will say, I did not get you the job. I just got you the interview. What you did the, with the interview was, you know, on you. So I ended up coming home and taught in Eversville, Illinois, for two years before I went abroad. What does At what point did you start the process or make the decision that you were going to be in international education. So you taught for two years in Illinois. When did you start? How did you, what did you do? Yeah. The issue with coming back home. Okay. The post-graduation, right. And this is the thing where, um, Hmm. How do I say it? Cause I want to, I want to connect it to the mantra of the black community. This is what I call it specifically the black American community. 
education is the key to enhancing our life chances. So, you know, go to school, get your good job, stay in your good job, you know, that whole thing. So we have these ideas about the good job and what the good job is going to present to you. And my imagination and my reality did not align, right? So I graduated from undergrad, had my little bachelor's degree, thinking I'm going to go up in the system, you know, come out, get my house, get my car, do my thing, you know? (laughs) And your girl was in her mom's, in her mom's house, (laughs) childhood bedroom house. I can't afford anything because of the credit card debt, the student loan debt. I could only afford a car to get back and forth to work. At that time, I was starting off at like 32,000 a year, you know? So it was just like, okay, all of that. And of course, I come from a working class family. So I have this way of saying, you know, the difference between having a degree and not was I was in the same income, in the same income bracket, but with a degree. There was no (laughs) difference for me, you know, as far as my family dynamics, there was no upward mobility. And maybe it is that microwave generation. Maybe we did have components of that, but it wasn't like... I could see anything happening in the next, you know, five years. So my way of understanding it was, well, okay, well, if education is supposed to make us more money, let me go back to school. Let me get this master's degree. So during my, during the, after the first year, I think, cause it was like a summer, it's only a year and a half program. I started going for my master's and in that master's program is when I met a young woman uh, from Brazil And she's the one who introduced me to teaching abroad. Her mother was a principal in Kuwait. And it was Mm. just like, Tiffany, you don't have to go to the Peace Corps. You can teach abroad. I'm like, what is that? Well, you know, there's all these different types of schools out there. No, I don't. (laughs) So she got me on the phone with her mom and got me in touch with some teachers in Kuwait. And I didn't get hired to go to Kuwait. I got hired first to go to Casablanca, Morocco. But -hmm. it was a whole world that we were not discussing here. Mm-hmm. I've got to say, you you probably have the most interesting journey I've heard of someone getting into international education because normally, let me not say normally, the people that I am in conversation with who, who do international education, they either had some international story where they were abroad, kind of grew up in the school, schools abroad and kind of knew it, or mm. they were, they were in university systems or job systems where they had immediate access to, you know, the fairs that happened, kind of the, Absolutely. the like search mm-hmm. and ISS and whatnot. They had access to those groups, but I, you, yours was really a lot of providence because to meet someone whose mom is working in that space, is it that I, I must say of many people I've heard it's, it's not, <laughs> For you to not be in that space, but to meet someone whose parent was in that space was was is a little bit different. And so I, I guess as this idea is ruminating and you're you're preparing to go, you mentioned it, you come from a family who didn't travel that much, you are first gen, and you decide you're gonna go to Casablanca. I ask this question of almost everyone, I, I, honestly, especially with family with family dynamics like yours, what is the reaction to you saying you go into North Africa? Okay, so so before I answer that, what is the reaction of me saying that I'm leaving this town to go to college? And it's, <laughs> it's, it's funny. I was just talking about this yesterday. And I have to be mindful because, you know, um, Tarana Burke, um, hashtag me too. She's the first person that I ever heard talk about her mother not having the capacity to be, you know, the type of mother that she wanted her to be. Like this whole assumption, I'm not saying that my mother is a bad person. It's first gen. She didn't know. Mm -hmm. And especially when it comes to Black communities, Mm -hmm. the closer you are, we have this assumption that we can keep you safe. So when it came to me even wanting to go to undergrad five hours from here, my mother was the first person to say, it's a community college up the street. The assistant principal said they can go in and get you this scholarship, what you need to leave for, you know? And I was thinking, I appreciate this. (laughs) I appreciate it, but I'm going. And, And college was my ticket out of this town. 
College was not my ticket to upper mobility. College was my ticket to be able to leave the space that I was born and raised in. So when study abroad came, I'm not study. Yeah, study abroad. The first time I left the country, my mom's mom, we didn't already let you go five hours from here. What you need to leave the country for? We def- and, and not that they said this, we can't protect you over there, but that's where it came from. We can barely protect you five hours from here. Why would we allow you to leave the country? And again, I said, I appreciate it, but I'm going, you know, it's like, it's something in me that I'm being called to do. So by the time um, working abroad came, they were like, Tiffany going to do what she want to do. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was like this girl and she's coming back safe. She's doing her thing. They had stories to brag on. You know, they benefit. I always say that they benefited more from my Casablanca than I did because everything that I experienced, everything that I, you know, the things that you buy and bring back and gift. They got more pieces of Casablanca than I do. I don't have anything from Casablanca anymore. But what, what happened was, you know, as, as my family started to get comfortable with me being, you know, outside of this space, it really switched roles to the point where when I ended up going to the UAE, my mother came to visit me there. You know, the same person who was saying, no, we don't want to let you go up the street because it's too far, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) come home before the street lights come on. She's out in Abu Dhabi taking taxis. Tiffany, I'm on my way here. I'm doing, you better do it because, you know, riding camels, doing things that she never imagined herself doing. Um, And it just kind of changed, it changed the family narrative of, of what, you know, our imaginations were and what we believed we could access. All right. So if you're joining us back from the break, you'll realize that Tiffany, when she was telling her story, kind of led us up to getting to Casablanca and getting into the region. And so, you know, I asked this question of just about anybody who moves somewhere that is different from where they came from. What was it like for you to move to Morocco? Because you grew up in a small town in Illinois, went to college at NIU. You'd studied abroad in South Africa, but I, you know, North Africa, Northern Africa and Southern Africa are very different. So what, what was it like? What was, what, what kind of struck you and what was a little bit even challenging? You know, I'm, I'm sitting with it for a little bit because, um, in the beginning, I'll say, I remember showing up to Casablanca and I was very surprised by the infrastructure because like many other countries, it is westernizing. And I was surprised right. to see like all of the stores. I forget like Mango and all these European and British stores that I like not, I'm not familiar with. But you know, you walk in and it's no different from any other typical mall. Casablanca uh is the how do you call it? Like the economic capital where everybody will come there specifically to work. So mm-hmm. the school that I worked at, and, and it's it's like a, the way that I used to scri- describe it, I said it was a very silent country because I don't speak Arabic. I was learning French and English was just not part of, you know, the the, the working language. So if you go into a store or a grocery store, most likely you're going to use your French restaurant as well. The menu is going to be in French. If you get into a taxi, if you're talking to somebody on, on the street, you know, you're going to use your pieces of Arabic. And I was doing it for a while. It was interesting. It was just like, OK, you know, I, I, I can even do the little accent. I got this. This is good. <laughs> And then, of course, I worked at the Casablanca American School. So it was English all in the school. We didn't need those languages in the school. But when I started to 
the, the honeymoon period started to wear off, I started to see things that made me feel very uncomfortable. And that was the very, very large economic divide in the country. You were either rich, you are poor, poor. And then you have like expats that come in to fill in that, that middle, middle class gap. Um, there were a lot of horrible things happening at my school. Some, some, some crooked things that came to the light that probably should not have. And then also I had a couple of experiences with being held up at knife point. Um, give me your phone, you know, give me your purse, uh, at night, you know. So it's as a black person, it's very, it's, it's one of those, um, contradictions because on front, I am read as my lineage from Africa. And then when I speak, start speaking, it is you're flat English. You don't speak French. You're not this, you know, what are you? And then that's when that American comes in and it's like, oh, you are welcome. You know, whatever preconceived notion I had about you, you were welcome. And you kind of get tired of that because you're read as it, it was Ivory Coast, Ivory Coast, Senegal, there's something about the um, armed forces, why there were so many people specifically from those countries that were living in in Morocco. Um, but it was like, if you were read as being from Ivy Coast or Senegal, you automatically had French. So, so you were not treated nicely. And as soon as they found out you're Black and from America, it's like, it's a whole different category. So that's when all of that started in Casablanca. Um, but it was just a lot. The language the mis the the different readings um the crime you know having to watch your front back side side i feel like after i had been held up i had a little bit of ptsd so anybody that came too close i'm jumping you know the soccer games oh my goodness they would come and tear up the streets and vandalize the cars and all. it was it was too much it was fun for the first year and that second year it was just like now I am mentally suffering. You know, I, 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 I did not leave America for this, you know, and the money wasn't great. It was just my first experience out of the country. So very, very complicated, very complicated. I think complicated is a good word though. I think um, for a lot of people, who have lived in multiple countries, there's at least one that's complicated. Sometimes sometimes it's the first country you fully live in outside. And sometimes it's just a country where it's just so out of your world. It, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's there's so many layers to sort of navigating it. I that's why I always think it's funny when people ask, you know, that question, what's your favorite country or your favorite experience or whatever. And it's right. We, I think, I think we have relationships with countries the way we have with people. Absolutely. <laughs> that was a domestic and, violent relationship. <laughs> oh no, but you, you, or, or, or just a high stress, like there's a lot going on in this relationship and I need a break, but you know, and, 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 and so I, let's juxtapose that because Morocco, North Africa, part of the Arab world, but part of Africa, but you, from there, you go to the UAE, correct? Yes. Like, was that your next assignment? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I, I love this because it's kind of regional. So then how does the experience and, and where were you in Ye UAE and how did that experience compare to your first expat experience? Right. I was actually thinking about this yesterday because <laughs> and this is just my, you know, can't sleep and just sitting in my mind doing this thing. Um, I remember when I decided that I was not going to return to, um, to the, to CAS because you have to let them know, you know, before probably like the beginning of that second year so that they can start, you know, with the recruitment fairs that they got, they have to replace you. Mm -hmm. So basically when I, it, when I made the announcement that I wasn't going to return, um, I started looking for schools and, and there were quite a few schools that I had closely, I'll say, uh, I would have selected Malaysia, um, Japan, um, a couple of different schools. But what, what sold me on 
It's ASA, the American International School in Abu Dhabi. I was in Abu Dhabi for two and a half mm-hmm. years. What sold me was the principal and the wife. And we were literally, I'm, I'm going through all of these online interviews. There was also a school in Dubai. It was a new school in Dubai as well. But we're, I'm going through all of these online interviews. You know, this is when Skype, Zoom wasn't even thought of, you know. <laughs> and I get online with these two white, white people. One is from, um, one is from America. And then the other one is from either the UK or somewhere in Europe. I want to say UK, but they had been living this international life where they had been working in multiple schools. He was the director and she was the elementary school principal. So as soon as she got on my previous principal, as soon as we got on the video, it was like home, you know, the Mm -hmm. interview just felt like home. And it was, you know, this is what we do at this school. We have 72 different nationalities and, 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 I have to make sure that I'm not <laughs> mixing them up. CAS, I'm, I want to say the acronyms of the school. In Casablanca, it was majority Moroccan students, majority. It was an American curriculum that was offered to local students. And these are elite local students, of course, but predominantly mm-hmm. Moroccan. Mm-hmm. In the UAE, their selling point in Abu Dhabi, particularly at this school, was that they had 72 different nationalities. In addition to the diversity of the school, they also had a diverse teaching staff. They believed in professional development. These, she's, she's speaking to my pain points that was already happening at, you know, this school in Casablanca. So everything that was the reason for me leaving this school, they were offering, and, and we do this different and we do this different. And, and many of the other interviews that I was having with schools, they weren't talking about those things. So, I mean, just the tone of the interview, her being very specific about, you know, what was offered and they offered me a leadership position coming in. Like we see your experience, you know, we also want to make you the grade level team leader. I was sold. You have me. I'm coming. When do you need me there? (laughs) Mm. Yeah. So if we add to that and I'm sure I've said this at some point on this podcast because I did. I have been to Abu Dhabi once and I really enjoyed being in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. I was there for a weekend, flew, flew specifically to back in my luxurious days, flew specifically to spend a weekend in Abu mm-hmm. Dhabi. Now it's flying from Doha people. So it was like 30 minutes, but how was living in Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi different than Casablanca at that point? Very much different. And it started with many of the people from Casablanca saying, why are you going to the, to the UAE? They're not the same. They're this, they're that, you know? And I was like, oh goodness, what did I just get myself into? Like it was, it was very distinct. We are not the same. So I went to the UAE, not with preconceived notions, but just, you know, kind of seeing, well, what was different? I did not Mm -hmm. need my Arabic. I did not need the French. I lost it all. Just as what was promised in the school, I found to be the case for the country. Very diverse expats from all over. It is, you know, it's a little bit about what's happening in the country. And then it's also a little bit about what's around the country. Because although I'm living in Abu Dhabi, I'm also across the street from Doha, from Bahrain, you know, a, a, a plane ride from all of the, the the countries in Asia, you know, and, and this is like, like you said before, the same amount of hours that it would take me to drive to another state, I can get to a whole nother country, half the price and half the time. <laughs> so it was, it was truly, that's when it felt like I was an expat. That was the first time I actually felt like I was living abroad and it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. It was me being comfortable as a teacher. It was me truly connecting with these students. I mean, it. I, I really found out that I enjoyed teaching in the UAE. Um, I felt supported, mm-hmm. you know, professional development. We were doing iPad initiatives. You know, it was like every common core. This is when that big shift was happening. It wasn't about the country. I was in a good school. Because, and that's the difference between, you know, folks that travel and people who are actually living abroad. My job was 
being a teacher and to be at a school mm-hmm. that's a good school that supports teachers, that believes in making sure these teachers are prepared and trained to offer, you know, the best education that's available because it's all competing, you know, especially when it comes to schools in the UAE, they're rated second under China for having the most international schools. So parents can plop their kids out of one school and put them in another. So these, these schools are competing for the highest bidding, you know, parent who's going to pay the tuition. But this was truly a good school under that leadership. So being in the country, it's a very Western country, you know, all the things that you can access in the States or wherever are there, if that's your cup of tea. Uh (laughs) Uh But like I said, Uh the, the majority of my time was spent in the school and it was great. It was great. What made you come back? Life. This is the psychological piece that a lot of people don't pay attention to when we decide to move to other countries. When I decided to come home, I actually quit in the middle of the school year and I was teaching. It was my first year teaching first grade. And I did not know that first grade was my favorite grade level. I quit in the middle of my best year of my teaching career. I was turning 30. I convinced myself that I was out in the world playing and I needed to go home and get a husband and kids. (laughs) I needed to go home (laughs) and stop playing in the world. Follow that society. Narrator says (laughs) she did not get husband. (laughs) (laughs) I just let me go ahead and fast forward to for y'all who are wondering. To be the barrier of bad news, your girl is 36 (laughs) and I'm still in the same, same space that I was, you know, when I was turning 30. But it was that that societal script of, of how we deem success. Like, yeah, it's cute that you're on the yachts. It's cute that you're, you know, traveling to all these countries. It's cute that you have, you know, the most diverse friends that you've ever had in the world. But what you don't have is that husband and kids. So that means you're failing. And that 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 mental cloud but how'd you quit in the middle of the impulsive? <laughs> That's the part. Impulsive. I, I got to go. Just, yeah. I got to go now. I'm just looking at you because we're trying to figure out you yeah. quit in the middle of the school year. You didn't even wait I till didn't. the summer. Like well, I, most normal. I waited for the next teacher to come. <laughs> I even trained her. You know, the funniest thing, Amanda, because I have given this some thought and it is a regret, you know, as I think about it from today, um, it is a regret. I had been accustomed to two year stints, two years in the States, two years in Casablanca, two years in UAE. I stayed for a third year and I think it disrupted my routine. So usually, you know, at that point, I'm ready for the next adventure. I'm ready to go and do something else. Give me another challenge. And I think I should not have stayed. I did. And this is the part of the story that, um, I really don't have a lot of opportunities to tell, but when I quit my job in Casablanca, uh, basically when I was doing all of these interviews online, it was because I was looking for schools at the end of recruitment season. So after those two years in Casablanca, I applied for PhD programs. I was like, you know, this was cute being over here in this international life. I'm just going to go home and go for my PhD. I applied for four programs and didn't get accepted into any. So at that point, it was, I'm not ready to go home to go back and teach. You know, I'll just find a job somewhere else. So then when I got the job at the last minute in the UAE, after that second year, when I knew it wasn't even burnout, I don't even know how to, I don't have a word for it. So we'll just put a pin there because it's something psychological. But when I decided to quit my job, that, because it was still the, the, the first semester that, uh, August to December period, I applied for six PhD programs and that was my exit, what I should have been doing in the first place. So when I quit in the middle of the school year, I got back to the States in December. And by that January, I had been accepted at the University of Minnesota. Yeah. So here's what I find very interesting. Um, and it's not foreshadowing. It's just telling about bringing you up to where you are right now. So you've left, you know, you've left the UAE, your, your PhD would have an education focus, but there are a couple of things that I think you've done. And, and I, I think for the people who know you or have heard of you, 
a lot of it has to do with your podcast, which also came about during the time you were doing your PhD, which if you don't know, it's Abroad in Ed. Why did you start Abroad in Ed? I started Abroad in Education because I was tired of telling my story and not tired of telling it in the sense of like, okay, here we go again. I was tired of people being surprised by the fact that Black teachers were teaching abroad. And this is 2016. It was actually the beginning of this program. I got in and I knew based on my, based on my experience, you know, with all this teaching abroad and stuff going into higher ed, I'm like, yeah, I know my, my study is going to be something about black teachers, some, something about black teachers abroad. I didn't know what it was. I couldn't even, you know, understand like, how do you even create a study? Is it qualitative, quantitative? What are all these things? So in this, I'll say just like sticky period of telling my story to professors, trying to understand, is this a study abroad thing? Is this a teaching abroad thing? You know, my my program is comparative in international education. I've taught in Morocco and the UAE. This is me telling my story to them. And how can I use my story to create this project? Girl, they couldn't even get to the point of how do I create the project because they were stuck on the story. Black people are teaching. Oh, it must be military. Oh, it must be Peace Corps. Oh, it must be. And I'm like, no, come with me. Like there's a whole population of Black American teachers that are leaving the U.S. K through 12 system to teach abroad. There were a few of us in Casablanca, but when I went to the UAE, oh, we're over there going in droves, right? But because this is not something that is talk- talked about in like the academic space, more like pop culture, this is when the travel noirs were coming up, No Madness Travel Tribe was coming up, you know, we're having the spaces in our networks, but it's not an academic space conversation. So I made it, I was taking this course, um, mm, I'm forgetting the name of it. It, it stemmed from a course. And I said, I've been sitting on this idea of creating a podcast. And I said, rather than continuing to tell my story, I'm going to interview other people to tell their stories. And this is before podcasting was a thing, right? This is before COVID. (laughs) This is before everybody was just like, let me stay home and start a podcast. This was so vulnerable. And I, I interviewed a young woman who I worked with in Abu Dhabi and I played an episode (laughs) in air quotes um, for the court, for my exit project of this um, class that I was taking. So the feedback that I received from my colleagues was like, you have to continue doing this. Like, this is so interesting. I didn't even know. It was almost like characters, like that's how black people think. And in the whole thing, this is the Naima episode, which did get released in 2018. Um, she's talking about what it means and what it felt like to be a black woman abroad and how oftentimes she's perceived as a prostitute and just kind of going through these like, no, I'm not just because I'm black doesn't mean I'm this. And that was just so fascinating to, you know, the group of people that I was around, which was no different from my time at Northern. I'm still that one speckle in a pool of, you know, white people. So just from, you know, the interest that I received from the class and then kind of having those conversations with my uh, professors and stuff, I stuck with it. So a broad education was basically to not keep the mic, but to hand the mic over to other folks to tell their stories as well. So it's teaching abroad, study abroad, any type of international engagement. Which is why you're here. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't even know how we got connected. I was on your podcast, actually. You were. That's the thing I, the first yes. I didn't know who you were. You were just like, can you remember my podcast? Yeah. I'm like, okay. The Black I, appar- I apparently do not say no to podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because, and this is the beautiful thing about and I, I have to call us a network because, and, and these are not my words, but I will say that it has been given to me that we are, you know, some of the original pioneers of these conversations about expats abroad, not 
because mm. we are very different from travel noir. We're very different from no madness. That is very much travel. But for us, we're mm-hmm. about building lives, unpacking lives, stories abroad, you know, like these real narratives about navigating. And mm-hmm. I met some folks who knew you and they were like, you have got to talk to my girl, Amanda. <laughs> And the first time it came and I was like, okay, I'll get around to it. Right. And then the second time it came, I'm like, all right, I've already heard. And then it may have been another time. I'm like, okay, you got me. So. I don't even think the funny part is I don't even think I'm that serious. But then this is when I I had a moment that I could not stop laughing. And it is the most random moment. Last summer, I was taking a photography class. And, you know, everybody's like talking about what you do. And I say, yeah, I'm taking a photography class. I have this thing called the black expat and I want to take more like better photos of my camera. And (laughs) this girl in this class, black girl says, Oh my gosh, I know who you are. My professor talked about your site. Absolutely. (laughs) And I was like, what? (laughs) And she's like, yeah, we've been on your site. And I'm looking at her like, Okay. I, I feel like I'm, I mean, I, I feel like I'm black famous. <laughs> you know, like, actually, I'm more than black famous now, but like in the expat world, I'm like black famous. And, I, and I'm not saying that with any kind of arrogance. It was just hella funny. Cause I was, it was randomly like a Wednesday night. I'm minding my business. And she's like, Oh yeah. My professor introduced us yeah. to, to your work. <laughs> and I was like, to my work. I got work, y'all. <laughs> work, so. well, well, that's the thing so, about you yeah. and I. It's like, and, and we have these conversations, but what we're doing with this space is not pose for the gram, right? We're having right. <laughs> really like in-depth conversations about what does it mean? You know, what are the things that we carry in our bags with us? What does it mean to have these like multiple identities or shifting identities or, you know, contradictions? And what do you do with that? It's a bigger conversation with us. Although one day, though, when we get there, we I would love to do the most ridiculous photo shoots at these expat locate of of people living in like right. This is this is my for four hundred fifty dollars. Right, you too could have, like I want to do all of that. I actually think it'd be funny just as a satire. But uh, you know, here's the thing: I feel like you've you've come full circle because much of your dissertation work was focused on the experiences of black educators abroad, Absolutely. which, and, and, and your podcast was a key part of that and the research you've done. And we're sitting right now talking because you are in Alton, but you're going back. Yeah. And, and I, and I, here's the thing. I knew you were going back. I, of course I knew you were going back, but it, it's, it's sort of clicking for me. It's really funny considering how you left before you did your PhD, yeah. right? And, yeah. and we're like, I'm leaving here. And the opportunity has been given for you to go back and continue to do new work and different Absolutely. work that's there. And so I, I ask this question a lot of folks and you have not left yet, but you did spend almost a year recently in the UAE. What is it like to go back once you've lived in a place before mm-hmm. As, and, and, and that, and obviously that applies to the UAE, but in some ways it also applies to Alton. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have not lived at home since 2011. So coming home was, and, and the funniest thing, Amanda, I'm sitting here like, I know repatriation could work but you can't repatriate eight times. Like it just doesn't work that way. (laughs) But this is where I have to bring out my inner James Baldwin because he defined himself as a transatlantic commuter. So really just accepting the fact that in his lifespan, whether it was, you know, states to Paris, states to Turkey, states to, you know, wherever it was he was going, there was always this commute between, you know, the States and abroad. And I think what I'm learning about myself is that there is no um, end point. There is no destination. There is, you know, when I was 30 and I was like, I just want the husband and the kids and I want to be successful, (laughs) whatever society describes that is. 
as we said, here I am 36 in the same space, no husband, no kids, which that's not going to be the case for long. We're just manifesting and accepting and praying about that. But to go back in a different capacity, right? So I really have to sit with this. And this is the timeline. I worked in the UAE between 2013 and I quit in the middle of the school year 15. So 13 to 15, two and a half years, school years, I should say that. Came back to the States December um, 15. I went back for data collection and I was actually there for 14 months, 2019 to 2020. Built a relationship um, with the uh, Al Qasimi Foundation, came back here, a vacant position opened up, and now I'm going to go back and work for this same foundation. So this is why I call it spiritual work, <laughs> because it's really one of those things where I don't know why I'm going back. I had a plan to go back abroad, but it wasn't like I have to specifically go back there. I also had multiple applications submitted to Washington University across the bridge for a postdoc in St. Louis, uh, Wisconsin, Madison, um, you know, all of these other higher ed universities and nothing, no doors were opened. As soon as I applied for this position in the UAE specifically, the door was like, come on through. So I, I don't quite have the feeling yet because it still feels very surreal. And this is because, you know, graduation was a couple weeks ago. <laughs> well, defense then walking the stage. Now I'm, I'm literally packing my apartment, but I can only give, you know, glory to God because I don't even know what this is going to be. It's a position. It's my first position outside of a classroom. Um, the position is director of scholarships and student programs. So I'm still very much working on, on the realm of higher ed and students that are going into higher ed, but this is going to be an adventure and, and, and your girl is ready. <laughs> I am ready. <laughs> so I'm super excited for you. Um, definitely as we're wrapping up because by the time this airs, right? you're going to be a couple of weeks, if not a couple of months into your new role. And so I want to make sure for people to kind of continue and track with your journey. You've got your podcast, which I know you're going to start re-recording or start recording again, but I do want to shout out Abroad and in Ed because there's so much great content there already, especially for those who want black and brown perspectives living abroad, but also want educator perspectives abroad and, and kind of those intersections that it's it's a great canon of, of work already, mm -hmm. irrespective of when new stuff is being added. And I know that you are using your skills as a podcaster to definitely coach and, and workshop and teach others on how to tell their stories digitally Amen. because you've been doing it before other folks have. So... Yeah, where, where, I put this in the show notes and I ask people to say it anyway for the, the people who like to listen. Where can people find you and or follow you? We'll do IG and Twitter, uh, abroad underscore N I N underscore E D. And then, of course, you can go to the website, um, abroadineducation.com. I'm realizing how many times I have said, um, I don't like it. <laughs> it's like, um, 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 um. The critique. It's okay. The critique. It's okay. The problem is, is that when you're a podcaster right. you and you go back and listen to yourself, you hear all Everything. the things that you say. Everything. Which is why there's something that I do quite a bit, but I'm not going to say it because if I say it, people are going to go back and, and listen. Right. I, I do it. So I'm not mentioning it. But here's the great part. Um, all of your contact information, once again, is going to be in our show notes. It is going to be on the blackexpat.com and the globalchatter.com. And so if I say this with most folks, if you can't find Tiffany Lachelle Smith, Dr. Tiffany Lachelle Smith, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can follow us on social media because we're following her and she follows us. So if, at the worst case scenario, you could do a search and you will find a broad and ed. 
Oh my gosh, Tiffany, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being you and doing your thing as always. You no, know, I'm trying. You know, I'm I I, I I do something every now and then. You know, I'm doing a l I'm doing you, a little you, something. You, you gotta look great. I got I got you gotta look great in this over there. I got some projects <laughs> I got my hands on. You've just listened to an episode of The Global Chatter, which is hosted by me, Amanda Bates. It is edited by Stephanie Ficcio. Don't forget to subscribe to The Global Chatter on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us on Instagram at The Global Chatter or stop by Twitter and find us at Global Chat Pod. If you have a question, want to subscribe to the newsletter or are interested in sponsoring, visit theglobalchatter.com. 